In today's episode, we talk about how to get lean and fit without counting a single calorie and without having to pay attention to tracking everything. Check this out. Okay, look, here's a fact. In order to lose weight, you have to take in less calories than you burn. However, counting calories is often a failing strategy for people when it comes to long-term success with weight loss. So in today's episode, we're going to talk about all the different ways you can get lean and healthy without ever having to count a single calorie. Mm, yeah. Maintain flexibility. That's it right there. You know, the first point I made is, is definitely true. And this is where people get tripped up is that it is true. You have to take in less, less energy than you burn. It's, a, it's, it's what's called an energy imbalance. So to put it plainly, if you burn 2000 calories through just being alive and activity and everything else, and then you eat a thousand calories, your body has to make up the difference. And ideally what we would like for it to do is to tap into fat because body fat is a, a way your body stores energy. And so that's how weight loss happens. So it's, it sounds very logical that in order to lose weight, you just figure out how many calories you're burning and then count calories and make sure you stay under that. And then boom, you lose weight. And it does work. The problem is it's got a very uh, high fail rate over time, right? So it works in the short term, but long term, it tends to not work very long. What was very your long. your personal journey um, with like figuring out macros and calories like? Did, were you somebody who, because I know um, you really don't, you never really, even, even when you, I think you were getting shredded, I don't think you, <clears throat> you tracked really, did you? No, I don't because- You're not a big I've done it checker. before. I've yeah. done it before um, just so I know how to do it in, um, you know, counting macronutrients and being aware of that kind of stuff. So I, I'm aware of what's in food, but I never liked it because it always felt- um, what's the word I want to use for lack of a better term, unnatural. Like it didn't feel like life. It's like robotic. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, and I could be that way. Like I could totally be robotic when it comes to fitness, but it just felt, you know, you consider my, where I come from and my culture and my, and my family, we do so much with food and we celebrate so much with food and I already had food intolerance issues. So I already put parameters on things. Like, you know, I had to tell my Italian mom that dairy and gluten bothered me. Yeah. So that was, that didn't go over so well. Yeah. But, you know, then I'm going to start counting calories and macros when we have weekly Sunday dinner or my mom would cook dinner every night when I was a kid. Remember, I started as, working out as a kid. So it just felt like, gosh, who would do this, you know, uh, for it just didn't feel right. Now, the irony of that, Adam, is I had my clients initially count calories and I'd give them meal plans, but I'd see them fail. I'd see them do well for a few months and then fail. What about you, Justin? Well, I mean, I, I definitely kind of went through the the counting calories thing just to, to get a good awareness of it and to be able to see like how I could how I could manipulate it and shave down and weight and try and get leaner I, I I've never been a big fan of it but again I know the value is there in terms of like if I could figure this out specifically to my own habits and and um, really identify some of those food groups and things that are contributing the most like you know, it's usually on the fat side for me is like where all those calories really kind of come up. Um, and, uh, that was something that I was able to kind of just slowly adjust from there. And like, I guess for me, the value was finding the ways to just tighten screws in what I, my normal habits were. If I wanted to then, uh, make it a little bit more sustainable approach later when I wanted to manipulate my weight and get leaner. Uh, so I did enjoy the, uh, peering into that and seeing like what I tended to gravitate towards and like what kind of, if I had coffee, I tend to have it a little bit with some sweetener or something. And like, if I just tapered off of that and then reduced, you know, that from a calorie perspective and also like, you know, just little things that I could do that uh, made a big impact and difference. I translate that to my clients a lot more effectively. Yeah. Now, Adam, you, you, aside from competing, cause obviously you competed at uh, really the, some of the highest levels when it came to physique, you got yourself a pro card, and that requires that you just, you have to dial everything in and get to a really extreme body fat percentage and obviously compete against other people doing this. Besides that period of time, which I think tracking is essential, did you do it outside of that a lot as well? Or were you much more I did, different? I did leading up. Um, I, I did leading even, so even before competing, I had, I had already, you know, I mean, we've talked before on the show about, you know, calorieking.com. And I used to have, before it was .com, I had the little booklet uh, with all the macros in it. I used to buy hand, used to track it. This was well before the My Fitness Pals and Fat Secrets came along. So I, I was a, a on and off tracker, but it was used to be like when I was on my kick, I was tracking. When I wasn't on my kick, I was totally oh, I off the rails. 
my relationship with it now, and that's why I really I, I like this episode that you prepared because I'm a big advocate of tracking. I just think that um, it's an it's a good part of like educating yourself on your your habits. Uh, what is a protein? What is a carb? What is a fat? How many calories do each of them hold? Like, I think there's, I think there's a, a tremendous value in in figuring some of those. Then once you kind of have an idea or a baseline in that, I think it's even healthier to move away from it. So I, I think like the like the tips that you have written out or the hacks you have written out today, um, I would say this is how I live my life now. Like I can still get leaner and build muscle and get in shape, and I don't need to weigh and measure and track. I just have some, a handful of like, I think principles that I follow or pay attention to, uh, when I know I want to move the needle a little bit. Yeah. You said it actually really well. I, I agree. I think, um, it's an important part of, uh, knowing what's in food and seeing what's in food, right? Cause calories, uh, besides calorie counting calories count. In other words, there's no such thing as this whole, like there's this movement where calories don't matter. Okay. That's baloney. They do matter, their energy, and if that energy discrepancy is in the negative, you're going to gain body fat, regardless of what your diet's made up of. Macronutrients matter. I mean, proteins and fats are essential, I meaning if you don't get the right amount of them, you will you actually will fail to thrive. You can actually have terrible health consequences. <clears throat> carbohydrates are not essential, but carbohydrates do contribute to things like athletic performance. And besides that, calories and macronutrients are important for health, um, muscle gain or preservation, satiety subjective feelings of energy um, and health, which how you feel is a huge part. And that's where the, the challenge comes in. This is where the, the trouble that comes from counting calories. When people count calories, they often, this is the answer that's all I'm going to do. When, and, and it's almost like they forget or they don't regard the fact that humans, we're not robots where you can plug in a program. We're behavior-based emotional creatures. And food, for the most part, Okay, except for the small percentage of people who are competitive, who compete in bodybuilding or physique or stage presentation sports or athletes that have to make weight, for example, for maybe wrestling or boxing. Besides that small percentage of people, nobody eats with this this you know this formula long term. Everybody eats mm. based off their behaviors, right? Mm. It's all behavior and emotional based. So it makes no sense to ignore that and go totally with calorie counting. Or I should put it differently, it makes no sense to focus most of your energy on the behaviors. It's good to have the information to use as data, but <clears throat> since we're behavior-based creatures and we eat based off of behaviors and emotions, we need to focus most of our efforts on that. And that's where we find success. So I, you know, I wanna ask you guys, when did you see this switch with your clients where you saw that, oh, this is actually, a, this maybe changing my strategy. Cause I used to give clients meal plans and tell them to get calories and that stuff. Right. And they'd see results in the short term, but in the long term they always failed. It wasn't until I did what we're going to talk about on this episode. I did that later, and I just saw a bunch better long-term success. Yeah, it's funny. It, I think the theme remains the same <laughs> with uh, being a, a good coach is that I figured it out much earlier for my clients than I did for myself. Yeah, that's true. You know, so uh, I started to realize this, you know, very early on, writing a diet, handing it to a client, and having them, <clears throat> you know, follow this to a T was extremely unsuccessful and that starting to piece together some of the the stuff that we talk about that all addresses behavior stuff was uh, way more beneficial. In fact, one of the things that is highly contested or debated in the fitness space is the uh, s multiple, several small meals and how it doesn't make a difference. Mm. I'm actually somebody who would argue the other side and advocate for it, not for the reasons that uh, I think that it was argued in the past, which is it, you know, stokes the fire of your metabolism. Yeah. And if you eat more meals for the day, you got this roaring metabolism and it speeds them. None of that, because if calories are all equated the same, then it doesn't make a difference if you have two huge meals or six small ones. But what I realized was when my clients had, you know, five to six prepared small meals and they had something ready to go and they were eating every two, three hours, they never got really, really hungry. They never got to that point where they were fighting cravings off. They were always yeah. eating before they were feeling that come on. Plus they planned it. And they had it all planned out. Yeah. And so they made better decisions. And so even though there was this crazy movement early on to put, you know, make the small meals and then all of a sudden we shit on that science and everybody went away from that again. 
I'm still one of those people that are like, uh, I'm still a fan of that for a lot of people because, again, I think it addresses some some behaviors some, that we have created around eating that I don't think are good behaviors. And this is a, a simple hack, in my opinion. I don't even think that was on your list. Um, no, that, that's a great one. But that's that's one that I'm still <clears throat> very pro for, for that exact reason. Yeah, I think it's um, the key here, or what should I say, the goal is to figure out how to modify your behaviors so that you automatically get close to calorie and macro targets. In other words, are there ways that I can get my behaviors to change where I feel good about it and it feels natural, which lead to I'm eating the right amount. I'm eating the right amount of proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, and I feel good. And I do want to say this. If your goal is to, is to get to 5% body fat, this probably won't work for you. Mm -hmm. This works very well long-term. So this is a very good, like, generally relatively lean I'm a man. I'm around 12, 13% body fat. I'm a woman. I'm around, you know, 18 to 22% body fat. If you want to get super ultra shredded, you're going to have to track. I'm going to, I'm going to argue that a little bit. Uh, that's partially true because, and, and your very first point we're going to move <clears throat> into is to eating protein first. I would make the case. So let's just say, uh, even though I'm not, but let's just say I like, I, I do want to get down to 5% body fat again. I actually would still start here. So I still would start with all the behavior things first before I actually really try and hone in. When would you start tracking it? What body fat percent generally do you think? When I start to struggle with plateaus. Oh, okay. So whatever I, that is. That's right. Because yeah. I, I, I think you can get really far with this. I agree. I think you can get really, really lean and in good shape. Some people better than others. I think you're a, probably even a better master at it than I am because I think you've trained yourself to use the behavior ways. I, I would have to probably switch over to tracking when I get around 9%, I would mm. probably say. I could probably get all the way to 9% relatively easy. Not easy as in the it wouldn't take discipline and consistency. Easy as in if I just followed some of these steps that we're going to talk about and the very first one, eat protein first, that is, that is the very first thing I do. So I'm glad you labeled that as the first one. It's like when I decide I'm, I'm, I'm going to dial in, I really want to change my body composition, I haven't been paying attention to my protein intake at all. That's the very first thing that, that starts to shift uh, shift over. Yeah, so what this basically means is when you have your meal in front of you, the protein portion of your meal, which usually is the meat portion, so it's either beef or chicken or eggs or dairy, the, the protein portion of your meal, eat that first. And that modifies your behaviors a couple different ways. One is it, it and this is huge, it manages your blood sugar levels or your blood glucose levels, right? When you get these highs and lows, that affect in blood sugar, that affects your behaviors by making you feel irritable, lethargic, and having cravings. So that's one. Number two, immediately protein is very satiating. If you eat 30 grams of protein or 50 grams of protein before you eat the rest of your meal, that protein, and studies have shown this uh, very, very clearly, that protein blunts your appetite and makes it so that you don't just don't want to eat as much. So when clients are, would eat protein first, it would lead to a behavior that naturally made them eat less overall. It was a very, very easy uh, hack with this one right I, here. I want to add to that um, because what happens when someone hears that or when I, when I teach this to a client, they go, oh, okay, okay, I get it. And then they would make this effort that when they have you know breakfast, lunch, or dinner, that they would eat the protein first and then move to the other other. Um, macros. The challenge becomes when people have the temptation to want to snack in between meals. And so my rule to add to this, this is the rule that I have for myself. When I start making protein a priority, that means I actually won't even eat anything unless I have a protein with it. So I will not like... like protein really works for this. It, yeah, it does. It's just, it's just a simple, like, for example, if I, oh, I want some grapes right now, I will not just sit down and just like, chomp away grapes you know it's a fruit you like a meat a stick first that's right i would eat a beef piece of beef, jer beef jerky with it or i get four to six ounces of a meat and then have the grapes so i won't allow myself just to sit down and snack even on a, a, a carbohydrate that somebody would consider as quote unquote healthy or a better choice because what ends up happening is i i then if i if i allow myself to do that then I end up feeling filling my behaviors too. This is not me tracking, just naturally fill my calories up with carbohydrates and I never hit my protein intake. So anytime I sit down to eat, protein first. And if I really, really want those carbs, again, I got to pair it with a protein first and eat it first, even when I'm snacking. Yeah, for the record, uh, protein provides the most satiety. 
So it blunts appetite the most and you get full fastest on it and the longest. Second would be fat. Third is carbohydrates. So carbohydrates are the least satiety producing. And I think that's why you're talking about these carb snacks in between because they do tend to, um, you know, I feel like it actually makes me hungrier. It does. As a result. Here's a giveaway for today's episode, Maps Anywhere. It's the equipment-free workout program. Do it anywhere. It's great for beginners, intermediate, and it's also great for advanced people. There are modifications to make the workouts really kick your butt. Anyway, here's how you can win. Leave a comment below this video. Um, make sure it's a good comment and do so in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. Do all those things. If we like your comment, we'll notify you in the comment section. We'll comment under your comment to let you know that you won Maps Anywhere. Also, we got a sale going on right now. We have two workout program bundles that are 50% off. The Skinny Guy Bundle, which has all this amazing stuff, and the Fit Mom Bundle, which has all this other amazing stuff. Both are 50% off. If you want to get signed up, click on the link below at the top of the description to get yourself that discount. All right, here comes the show. All right, this next one, this is a powerful one. And this one I figured out before I figured out all the other ones we're about to talk about right now. <clears throat> and that was to avoid heavily processed foods. Like if you have one rule in your diet, it's just, I'll eat as much as I want. I'm just not going to eat these ultra processed foods. Okay, so ultra processed foods are in boxes or wrappers. They have long shelf lives. They have ingredient lists that are you know, so like all the inside portion of the grocery store. Yes. For the most and, part. Yes. And, and studies now show why they're such a big deal. These foods are engineered to make you overeat and they're so good at it. <clears throat> they're so effective at making you overeat that studies show now pretty clearly that people will eat 500 more calories a day just because they're eating these foods. Not because they're high calorie foods, but because they make you eat more. In other words, I could take whole natural foods that are high calorie give me some avocados and steak. Those are very calorie dense foods. And then put next to it ultra processed foods and you'll end up eating more calories with the ultra processed foods, even though these are more calorie dense because they're engineered. Yeah, Remember? There's more engineering there to, to really get your palate to go crazy. And um, it just, just prompts you to seek out more uh, novelty and more foods that are going to fit these very specific sweet or salty type of high level of uh, flavors. Yeah. To give to give an example, and this is this isn't an ultra processed food, but it is processed in comparison to its whole natural part. Think of how many apples you can eat in one sitting. Now think about how much apple juice you could drink in one sitting. So apple juice removes the fiber, removes the skin, and you don't have to chew on it. You could just drink it. And you can go much further. Now, the example I always use is a big family bag size of potato chips, which is like five or six potatoes. I don't know anybody can eat five or six plain potatoes all at once. I know a lot of people eat a whole bag of chips. I'll, you know, I'll raise my hand. I could do it. Right? I could eat a whole bag of chips and you know, afterwards I'll feel full. But if you put five plain potatoes in front of me, poof, I don't know if I could do it for $5,000. It'd be really hard. I would gag. So these foods make you overeat. So just avoiding them naturally brings your calories down. So I'm going to I'm gonna add to that hack also. Um, if I am going to eat something in a wrapper, in a bag, in a box, in a can, then the one rule I give myself during this time is that it needs to have 25% or more coming from protein. Oh, I see. 20%, 5% of the calories. That's right. Yeah. Which is, that really limits the processed foods that I'm going to have. But it opens the door for, oh, you know what? I'm just, I'm a little light on my protein. I don't have time to make something. I can go have a, sh a protein shake. I can go have a, a bar, a protein bar. I can do some of these things if I absolutely need to, even though my goal is always to eat whole foods first. But then if I go, okay, I, I don't have the time for that. I got to do something really quick. Okay, well, then I'm going to limit myself to something that says 25% of the calories come from protein. So then it is considered in a, a protein food. It's more likely to, to, or less likely, I should say, to make you overeat. That's right. Like the other ones. That's right. All right. This next one, Adam, was one that you actually, I heard from you first um, and I loved it, which is rather than taking foods away or out of your diet. So you look at your diet, like I want to get in shape. Rather than cutting foods out of your diet, think of some really healthy foods and add them in instead. And then eat those before you eat the other stuff. And what it leads to is naturally- I remove some of the bad foods. So contrary to what you would think in terms of weight loss coming into a program and you're a coach and you're like, okay, let's add some food to your diet. 
and you're trying to get on a diet, yeah. which is like, it's mind blowing, but yeah, to the point of it, you know, having a natural effect and behavior wise of changing and making better decisions, it's, it's quite substantial what it does. Well, you know, part of this, the, the evolution of it or the um, origin of it for me was actually doing this for myself because it, you know, it goes back to the, what the very first thing is, right. Is uh, eat protein first was the first hack and tip. And what I found I naturally do, and most all my clients naturally do, is when they're off the diet, they gravitate towards the, the carbs and the saturated fats and they under eat protein. And me just simply saying target protein, add protein in the diet, naturally started to clean the diet up. Mm. So I found it worked really, really well for myself. Then I applied it to my clients, saw how well it worked for them. And vegetables, thought, like low calorie fibrous vegetables probably work really well. With yes. the first ones, yeah, yeah. Pro proteins and then greens. Those, those yeah. are the two things I would add like right away. Like people were either under eating on their fiber or they were not getting a, a, enough protein in their diet and simply telling them no, I didn't tell them they couldn't have any certain foods. I just said, hey, we never get X, Y, and Z in your diet. Let's add those in just every day. I need you to hit these one or two things. And then, then let me assess the diet after that. Uh, lo and behold, they would magically all of a sudden start to mm -hmm. lean out and start to build a little bit of muscle and they would feel great. And I, and I knew I was playing, I mean, and you know, as a coach and a trainer, when you've been training people long enough that much of the battle is the psychological battle that you're playing with them. Like how, how do I close them or convince them to eat or train or do the things I want them to do without making them feel like I'm forcing them or manipulate them into that. And it was just like one of those trainer hacks of instead of me telling them they can't have stuff, I'm going to just focus on the things I know that will create better behaviors in their diet. And this was one of them. Yeah, there's like less need that, that intrinsic need to rebel. Right. You know? So it's like, you have this, um, you're coming in with less of a restrictive, like rigid, like concept of what uh, your diet could be. And I think it works so well because I just think that we're all kind of rebellious in nature. We yeah. are. And I think I, it's just I, in our nature to want to rebel. Yeah. And if you're watching this right now and you're like, Oh, you know, I don't need to do that. Uh, you know, I'm self-aware and you still have to lose 30 pounds or you've done diets on and off and they failed. No, your self-awareness is, I need to do this to myself because uh, I feel like I'm uh, otherwise depriving myself or restricting myself. And, it, and then I end up rebounding afterwards. So know yourself enough, enough to know that, you know, when I take things out of my diet, I end up rebounding. So I'm just going to add healthy things and then not even worry about the other stuff and then watch what happens. And what almost always happens is you end up removing some of the, the worst offenders. All right, this next one, this is a bodybuilder piece of advice. And bodybuilders used to talk about this all the time at helping them burn body fat and build muscle. Uh, the problem was the science didn't support it, except in the real world, it actually worked. And I think I know why. So the advice was bodybuilders would always tell people to drink a gallon of water every single day. Now, I, I've changed this a little bit because I'm talking to the average person, and I'd say a half a gallon to a gallon because a gallon for some people may be just too much. But I noticed when I would tell clients, target this much water every single day, make this your goal, mm -hmm. they would end up losing weight. Why? It tends to make you eat less and you don't drink other stuff. When you're drinking a gallon of water a day and that's your goal and you got your bottle next to you with the marker, I used to have my clients buy like, yeah. you know, where they'd have to drink four of these bottles and they'd have to track it throughout the day. It's like, they don't realize, but they're not, they're drinking less juices, less sodas. They're, they're, they're moving more because they got to pee. So they got to get yeah. up and walk and they're eating better because being hydrated tends to help with appetite. Yeah. And a lot of times they're mixing that signal of hunger with, um, you know, being thirsty and yep. being deprived of, or being dehydrated, um, in their body wanting to seek, seek this out. And so to, to be able to keep, you know, hydrating and, and, um, it, it keeps you somewhat satisfied a bit longer. And then also, I mean, you're, you're, you do run to the bathroom quite a bit more. So I guess you get an extra calorie burn. <laughs> I mean, you so your, your steps go up. <laughs> yeah. I don't see people they steps absolutely go up. do. I mean, I don't have much to add to that because you guys hit all the main points on why people have so much success with. The only thing that I would add to it is, and I actually believe even at the beginning of this podcast, meaning that this episode, but the beginning of us starting this podcast, uh, you guys used to tease me for carrying my gallon around yeah. yeah, and I'm very pro that the reason why I'm pro that is, you know, everybody has their little tiny little water bottle and it's like, they lose track of, did I fill it up already? Is this the second time I did yeah. it? The third time I did it. And there's something about knowing that I got to get through that whole gallon and seeing it 
all day long. And, you know, if it's something as simple as a whole gallon I, and I know that it's two o'clock in the afternoon and I'm not even midway through, I'm like, oh shit, I got some catching up to do. So there's something about that visual of seeing where you're at all day long for me that helps that accountability piece to make sure that I hit that. Otherwise I'd have clients revert back and they or you report back to me and they're like, Oh yeah, yeah. No, I definitely I drink like five or six of these a day. Like, oh, you do every day, and you track that. Are you sure about that? And when you'd have them track and do that, they, or all of a sudden you would have them carry the gallon. Now all of a sudden they're peeing all the time, and they, it drives them crazy. And you're like, wait a second, I gave you the same amount of water. I just put it in one jug, and now you're peeing all the time. Like, mm. sounds fishy to me. Yeah, I so I mm. I so the problem with the big the big gallon jug is people don't like to walk around with it. So what I did was I got these I got my clients to buy these glass really nice looking like jars or whatever. And four of them made up a gallon. Yeah. So I'd have them use a dry erase marker and they'd write one. And then when they'd finish it, they'd erase it and write two. So they could track. But yeah. you're right because when when I would tell them how many small bottles of water it was, they would lose track. Yeah. Nobody would keep track. So it makes it, it really helps. That's a great tip. It really helps to have a visual of where you're at for the day. Because what you don't want to do, and this doesn't work very well, is you know end of the day, like, oh, I got to drink half a gallon of water. It's 7 p.m. It doesn't really work too well. Yeah. The idea is to do this throughout the whole day. That's when you get those behavior uh, modifications. This next one is really interesting because what I'm about to say is going to sound silly, but studies have shown it contributes consistently to a 10 to 15% less intake or lowered intake of, of calories. In other words, if you just do the following, you will naturally eat 10 to 15% less, and that's to eat without distraction. So they take people and they put food in front of them and they have them either watch TV and eat or just eat or be on their phone and eat or just eat. Um, and just because they're distracted by their phone or the television or something else, number one, they eat faster. People tend to eat faster when they're distracted. Mm -hmm. And number two, they tend to eat longer or more calories because they're not paying attention to their body's signals. Now, I know for a fact, mm -hmm. I just talked earlier about eating a bag of potato chips, which I could totally do. I, when I do, if I could do that though, it would be in front of the television. If I sat with nothing around no, me. No, you totally wouldn't. If I wouldn't sat be able in to. silence, just eat a whole bag. You would no never way. do that. You have to be distracted. Yes. Yeah, I have to be right. watching a movie or something. For That's that what's happen. wild about that. Most people, um, if they're being completely honest with themselves, I mean, you have a whole different, if you sit in your room and you eat a whole bag of chips by yourself with no distractions and you have a whole That's different another thing. level. We have another thing we got to work yeah. on besides just that relationship with food, period. Get you outside. Most people are distracted when they eat. You know, it's funny when you bring up the 10%, I can't help but think that paired with just avoiding ultra processed foods is enough to get probably 60% of the country in shape. Oh. Like just saying- Okay, this is too complicated for me. There's too many hacks here. There's too many things to figure it out. Uh, okay, just eat whole foods. Just don't eat in front of a television or your phone or computer. And then that in itself would solve damn near. Adam, I would get people lose twenty pounds doing this. Yeah, mm -hmm. twenty pounds doing this and the and the whole and the processed food. That's it. Yeah. And most people want to lose about twenty pounds. People would trip out. So it's literally you just got to sit down. And eat without distractions. It makes that big of a difference. Yeah, I, I mean, also to your point of like eating fast, this was one that I noticed quite a bit, you know, with clients and myself, even personally, just in, in terms of like if I was in a rush or I was just trying to cram in food or, or if I'm just not paying attention to like the amount of bite sizes that I'm eating and then, um, you know, it, it, it you can bypass that signal of, of being satisfied uh, pretty easily by just cramming in a bit yep. too fast. Well, that's why I love the next one. This one's a big one. Because I think it pairs perfectly with that habit is if you're somebody who does that, try doing that without water. Yeah. Because uh, half of what impossible. makes you get away with yeah. that is you're chewing it, you're swigging the water down. I mean, I, I caught myself doing this last night. Last night I was I was talking to Katrina and, and Max. We're all sitting at the counter and we're eating stuff like that. And uh, I was drinking a Sevilla and I'm eating my steak and stuff like that. And I caught myself before the bite was even finished, grabbing my soda, sipping it down, it made me burp. And I'm like, oh my God, like I'm not even on TV. I'm not doing anything like that. But the fact that I was having conversation, not really kind of paying attention, it's just like, it's a habit that I have for yeah. sure. And it, you, a good way to become aware of that habit or to try and break that habit is to not drink any fluids while you have your meal. And every time I've taught somebody this, it always trips them out. They think, is that- I have to chew they, the they, hell out of my food. Is that unhealthy? 
I think it's unhealthy. You guys gave me five minutes to eat today. Yeah. I had to use this. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I was like, ah. You know what's funny? All of us, I guarantee, did this all the time because we train a lot of clients. And what you do when you train clients yeah, is you have five like minute break between five clients. in between. Yeah. yeah. So I'd be like, and I would use the water. Like I'm taking supplements almost. I'd bite, chew, 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 wash it down. Right. Chew, 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 wash it down. I started doing this because um, I was uh, recommended to stop drinking fluids with my food because it was affecting my digestion. Mm -hmm. So when you chew food, that's the first part of the digestive process. Not only that, but chewing activates digestive enzymes and tells your brain food's about to come through. So if you shorten the time you chew, you're going to end up eating more food. Also, breaking the food down into smaller and smaller pieces increases its surface area to volume, making it easier to break down by the gut. And when you flush a lot of fluid in your gut, especially water or other or juices, you actually dilute a lot of the acids in your stomach, and that can also affect digestion. But I know that sounds cool and sciencey, but the truth is that does play a role. But the biggest role here is it just it slows you down. Mm -hmm. Don't drink any fluids while you eat. You will eat slower, and you will get full faster as a result. All right, this next one, uh, this one is a big one also, and this was my 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 number one tool for trigger foods or problem foods. We all kind of have them. Like, think right now, if you're listening to this, of a particular food that is imp almost impossible for you to say no to or almost impossible to not overeat, okay? I talked about potato chips earlier. That one's mine. For my wife, it's chocolate. That's her big one. I've had clients where it was other things. And so what I, used to, what I came up with and it made a big difference is I'd say, well, let's create a barrier between you and that food because it's impulsive. It's an impulsive reaction. So all we have to do is create space between you, between you and the impulse. And it's, all you do is you're allowing for that for consciousness to come in, awareness to come in. Not that it's going to happen every time, but if you have a barrier, it opens up the space. And so my favorite barrier is I don't say I can't have potato chips. I just if don't have them in the house. And if I want them, I'll drive a mile down the, to the store and buy some. And that's totally fine. And what ends up happening is 95% of the time I don't. 5% of the time I do. But 95% of the time I don't because I get the craving. I get up and I'm like, oh, I would really love some potato chips. And I'm like, okay, I got to drive the store. And then, you know, by the time I think about it, awareness comes in. I'm like, do I really want them? It's nine o'clock at night. I'm going to feel not that good tomorrow. Nah, forget about it. There's a lot of different ways to actually do this. Um, I, you heard me mention one already. Like when it comes to the... Uh, eating the snacks or like the grapes, right? I won't say, no, I can't have grapes. I just said, I need to have a protein with it. It's really just keep, it's creating a barrier. Mm -hmm. It means that I had to go prepare the meat or go find some sort of a protein sure. to go with that if I really want that. And I'm not telling myself I can't have the grapes. It says, hey, my goal is to make sure I get these this protein in. So I'm creating a, a barrier with that. I've done this before too with like, if I really want something, I go, oh, okay, well, I first need to hit my protein intake for the day. If I hit my protein intake and I still want that thing, I'll allow myself to have it. Or I haven't worked out today. Like I need to get my workout in first. And then if I still want that thing, I'll have that. It's a like, barrier. That's perfect. So those, and a lot of times what ends up happening is I, I end up finishing the perfect day of eating, hitting my protein tank. And now I'm satisfied. Now I don't have that craving for that thing anymore. I don't even want it. It's not hard for me to, to not have it now. Or I get that great workout in and I, my body now mm. wants to be fueled with something healthy and good for me. I'm not craving that thing. So it's a, those are all ways of creating barriers other than not technically yet. Cause I like not having it in my house cause that's what I do also, but it doesn't mean you have to do it that way. There's other ways to create barriers. I used to have a client that we had this conversation. We're trying to figure it out for them and, cause they had other people in the house who would buy other snacks and stuff. And so she came up with a great one. She said, um, okay, I have to walk all the way down the street and back. So it means she has to get her shoes on, yeah. go outside, walk in the street. I mean, how far is that? It was like not even a quarter. It's like not that far, right? It's going to take you a grand total of four minutes. But the fact that she had put her shoes on, walk outside, walk all the way down the street and back. She's like, it's so weird, Sal. She goes, most of the time I say, it's not worth it. Why is it not worth it? Because you're, it's not impulsive. The awareness came in. You slow it down. That's slow, it. It's, it's all speed, you know, speed that to, to get it in as quick as possible. Uh, and if you, if you put something in front of that, so if it's like a practice like that, um, you know, it's going to really help, uh, deter it a lot of times. This is the, the electronic thing helps this way too. That that's another way of creating a barrier, right? If I say, I really want this bowl of popcorn, but nine times out of 10, when I want that bowl of popcorn, it's sitting down watching a movie. So I just say, Oh, I can have the bowl of popcorn. I'm just, not, I, I just can't have it sitting down in front of the television. So <laughs> 
finish watching my show. If I still want the bowl of popcorn, I'll sit at the yeah. counter and I'll eat it. Nine times out of 10, I don't eat it because I didn't want it that bad. I want it because I have this association with movie night. You know, the, I'm watching a movie and now I want to snack mindlessly on something. And so there is this, this psychological thing that you can play with yourself by saying that, you know, I, I can I can have if I want, but I, I need to do X, Y, or Z Dude, first. You just reminded me of a funny story. I had a client whose trigger food of all things was popcorn. So you know what the barrier was? They couldn't have microwave popcorn. They had to make it the old-fashioned way. <laughs> and and it worked because it took yeah. like 15 it's minutes. To, yeah. So they're like, eh, I'm not going to have it anymore. It's <laughs> so worth it. So funny. All right. This next one is to think self-care instead of self-hate. Okay. So what do I mean by this? Most people initially get motivated to lose weight or improve their appearance or their fitness because there's something about themselves they don't like. They don't like that they have their bellies too big or they don't like the way that they look. And so they go into exercise or they especially go into nutrition with this self-hate model. No, I'm fat. I can't eat that. No, I'm fat. I have to eat this. No, I'm fat. I have to eat this much less. The problem with that is self-hate, although a very it's a very powerful short-term motivator, Nobody wants to hate themselves forever. You just don't. It doesn't feel good. And what ends up happening is a diet ends up be feeling like a punishment. And eventually you rebel. And this is why when people go off a diet, they don't just reach for one piece of a food that they weren't eating before. They eat the whole box. Mm -hmm. It's because you're rebelling from this self-hate model. So instead, think, I'm going to take care of myself. I deserve to be taken care of. I deserve to be healthy. And when everybody likes to care for themselves. Everybody likes to feel like they're cared for, I should say. So when you approach your diet from that standpoint, by the way, this works perfectly with adding healthy food versus taking foods away, right? You're thinking pro-health rather than anti-fat, anti-obese, anti-whatever. It's pro-health, pro-care, and it just feels better. And you end up with more balance because you may have the cookie, but it's not a whole box of cookies. I know we listed this as, as a hack for you, but I actually think that this is a necessary thing that you you will have to arrive at this at one point in your life eventually right or you'll or this will never be a long-term thing that you do at one point uh you'll have to get off the, the hamster wheel of i'm on my diet i'm off my diet I'm, I'm on my training i'm off my training and part of that process requires that you reframe why you exercise if because most people exercise because they are trying to lose the fat because they don't like the way they look or someone made a comment all because of our insecurities. When you finally get to a place in your journey where you reframe it as I train because it does all these things for me. It makes me a better father. It makes me a better husband. I'm a better business partner. I'm uh, my sex drive is better. My skin is better. My energy level is better. I sleep when you start connecting it. And I deserve those things. That's right. All those yeah. things. And you want to do it because you love yourself. And that is the reason why you get up extra early or the reason why you choose to do it even when you don't feel it. That is what will keep you doing this for the rest of your life. So I know we have this listed as like a hack of helping you get there. I think it is necessary if you're going to stay here for the rest yeah, of your I life. Yeah, I couldn't agree anymore. All right, this last one is very specific. And I'm saying that because it's going to sound a lot like something else. So this last one is to not eat past 6 p.m. Okay, someone may be like, oh, I do you know, uh, intermittent fasting, or I, I eat within a time window. In the eight window, yeah. Not the same eight thing. Window. The, here's why it's not the same thing. This is why this ha this particular tip works so well. If you look at the foods that you eat that tend to be the worst offenders in your diet, they tend to happen late at night. Mm -hmm. They tend, if you were to analyze the average person's diet and you looked at what they ate in the morning, in the afternoon, in the for dinner, and then what they ate after 6 p.m., especially close to 9 p.m., mm -hmm. I bet you would see a larger percentage of heavily processed foods, garbage, overeating in the evening. That's when we tend to watch TV with our food. That's when we tend to reach for the snacks. We've already had our dinner. Now let's go eat that dessert or the snack or the chips or whatever. So when I have clients, hey, you know what? Let's set a time limit. Um, and it's just an easy parameter. I'd say for some people it was 7 p.m., some people 6 p.m., depending on when they got up. Let's just not eat past 6 p.m. and see what happens. It would result in like a 300 calorie uh, uh, reduction in calories. What's funny is uh, I even had some clients in that we had to apply this because it was a, a problem in terms of cravings, in terms of like after dinner, they would always want to then, you know, eat just a little bit of something. 
Um, and once they really started to get like serious about this, they actually even noticed too, they went to bed earlier, uh, on, on top of that, just almost like it's, it was just like kind of a natural rhythm thing of like, okay, now it's, it's time for bed. We, we had our last sort of big meal of the day. And then a couple hours later, they'd go to bed at like eight or like nine o'clock when normally they go to bed at like 12 and they're just up snacking, yeah. like watching yeah. TV all late. So it just had this kind of spillover effect of like better habits, even, you know, from there, not to mention all the digestive benefits from that uh, on top of that. Yeah. I actually have recognized that Justin in my own habits, uh, if I do a good job of shutting down my last meal by like six o'clock, I get to bed early. Mm -hmm. Always, almost always. If I allow myself to eat at any time late, late at night, or let's say I'm catching up calories because I'm behind on what my macros are. Oh man, I definitely, I find myself extending bedtime much, much later. You know, this is another example too of where the, the fitness space has done a lot of people disservice. Um, but like my earlier point of the small meals, like, right, the science came out to disprove that there's no technical, you know, mechanistic benefits of you actually. Yeah, if all the calories are the same, doesn't matter. That's right. Yeah. So, so what that ended up doing was it ended up deterring a lot of people that would have used that strategy to get in a shape that probably would have helped them out because they now hear like, oh, it doesn't matter. And there's a bunch of fitness people that have made videos off of doing that, that I think have done more harm than good. I think it's a good tip. This is another one. That's been debunked also. If calories are all quite the same, you eating your meal at 9 or 10, 11 o'clock at night, all the same thing. Doesn't make a difference. But what we have learned or le from training so many people is the point that Sal made is that if you looked at 90% of people's diets and you assessed where they made the worst choices, I would make the argument that a bulk of those, a good more than majority of those came after 6 p.m. Yeah, and yeah. so simply yeah. just putting that one, another barrier, right? Here's another barrier here. Not saying you can't have those things. I'm just going to say I'm going to shut it down by 6 p.m., you tend to make better food choices before that. And so I think this is a great tip and hack yeah. that has been debunked in the past. Yeah, this is one of the ones I'm still most consistent on. Um, aside from vacation and stuff like that, I pretty much always shut it down around 6 p.m., almost never after 7 p.m. Like I look at the clock even and I'll be like, oh, I want to eat something. I look at the clock. Uh. Now, the reasons for this aren't because uh, it keeps me lean or anything like that. For me, it has more to do with sleep and digestion. So there is some science to support that this is beneficial in other ways too, because not eating within two or three hours of sleep has been shown to dramatically improve sleep. And can that affect your behaviors? Absolutely. People who lose sleep tend to snack more and search for more hyperpalatable foods. Also, people have bad sleep also tend to have hormonal disturbances. Can that affect how much body fat you store, muscle you gain or you don't gain? Absolutely. So there's a lot of benefits to this. But I don't want to sell the science behind it because it's easy to discredit that. It's easy to read articles that say that will convince you, ah, maybe it's not that big of a deal. Behaviorally, if you just don't eat past 6 p.m., you're more likely to make better choices uh, with your food intake. Look, if you like Mind Pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out some of our guides. These guides can help you with almost any health or fitness goal, and they cost nothing. They're all absolutely free. You can also find all of us on social media. Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam, and you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. This one's really important, and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press, and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps, and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets, at the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out. And less injury. That's another thing. You'll see less injury as well.